Um, thank you very much, everybody, for attending the session on processing and analysing data. Could somebody please shut the door at the back? Thanks. Um, for our third speaker this morning, um, we're lucky to have Jeremy Vanderwall. Um, Jeremy is a spatial ecologist and senior research fellow at the Centre for Tropical Biodiversity and Climate Change, James Cook University. His research is focused on assessing the potential impacts of past, present and future climate on the distribution and abundance of species. This morning, um, Jeremy's talk will be Edgar, Improving Research and Understanding of Climate Change Through Public Engagement and Education. Thank you, Jeremy. All right. Um, I'm talking about a project that I did that was funded through ANS. And my project manager, Marion Brown, calls me the research champion here. Okay, I'm the one that had the ideas. I'm the one that's doing the modeling. I am that researcher. But at the same time, I recognize the issue is that my research is going into scientific literature, but not getting out to the people that need it. Okay. So I am a trade spatial ecologist. Okay, I'm looking at broad scale patterns and that because of the work I've been doing recently, I've started with the e-research center at JCU as the deputy director, leading a lot of the E research projects in ecology. But again, I am that researcher. I am the one that I'm trying to get others involved with in new research. So a bit of background, climate change is happening. There's a lot of information going out there. All the public tends to see is that, that catastrophic stuff that's coming out through the press. Don't believe everything the press says. Um, I recently put out a paper on birds and climate change the headline for the Cairns post, koalas at risk to climate change. There's issues there. Um, but there's vast amounts of information. There's huge research being done on climate change impacts, but it's lost in that scientific literature. How do we get it out of that literature into the public? This year is just simply, depending on how much greenhouse gas emissions we put out, how much we do, you can look at predictions of temperature. These are all scenarios that are widely known in the climate change literature, but very few of the people in the general public know it. Similarly, Bureau of Meteorology, Climate Change in Australia, they put this information out here as how warm Australia is going to get, given here's different greenhouse gas emission scenarios. Behind that is a vast number of models, and so they put out information on the 10th, 50th, and 90th percentile. So you can see that there is variability into the future, and it depends on what we do in terms of mitigating it. But we're going to be anywhere between 2 degrees warmer or over the 5 degrees warmer in Australia. Precipitation is a similar pattern. We're going to get drier, we're going to get wetter, or someplace in between. This information is known, and it's largely depending on how we curb our emissions. Okay. And if you're thinking, okay, climate change in the future, you might be skeptical of it, you can look at climate change over the last 60 years in Australia. This is something I've recently done. And over the last 60 years, we've seen areas of very slight cooling, but intense warming in terms of almost 2.4 degrees in some of these areas. And that's 60 years in the past. So it's not projecting into the future. This is what we've seen. And it's had impacts. If you look at bird species, They've been moving. Their distributions have been moving. What is suitable for birds has moved by up to 500 kilometers a year, or 500 kilometers over the last 60 years. But getting this information out to the public is, on, is a difficult sell. These, each one of these arrows is a single bird species and how it's shifted. Okay. Now, we can use the same sort of stuff that we've learned from what we've done in the last 60 years and project into the future. The way we do it, is by doing these impact models. There are two key pieces of information in it. There are occurrences or observations of species. Where is the species observed? And some environmental information. Spatial data on climate, topography, that sort of information. Okay? We make the assumption that what we know about where a species occurs informs us about its limits in terms of environmental attributes, okay? We put that in some sort of modeling algorithm, 
predict the distribution, do some testing on it, modify it. And so a lot of our testing is model statistics, but it's also expert opinion, okay? The key thing is garbage in, garbage out. And this is where we can use the public here, is those observation records are opportunistic data. They're museum records, they're personal databases, they're things where people have gone out, seen the species here. It's not regularly collected, it's not randomly sampled, it's, it's opportunistic. It's then brought together into large databases such as Atlas of Living Australia. Okay, they bring in all this information together. There's some 30 million records, observations of species in Australia for birds, mammals, reptiles, and amphibians sitting in that database right there. The problem is there's errors in it, okay? People type things in wrong. Old records have the species was observed in Australia, so it comes out the dead center of Australia. Um, there are old records that say it's in the city, so it's in the middle of that city, okay? There are errors. Um, and so it is opportunistic data. Some of the errors are as simple as what you see here. It's for cassowary. Cassowaries don't swim, okay? So records off the coast are just wrong. Um, but then there are much more complex errors. The traditional way we clean these up, so for any sort of research we do, we usually just print up maps like this, put all the observations on it, send it out to experts. We hope within a couple weeks, a couple months, whenever, we get some information back, and it's usually got some chicken scratch on it where we're supposed to try and interpret it when it comes back. This one's fairly simple, saying, hey, it doesn't occur in the ocean. You need to check those records there, it's, he's unsure about them, and the species doesn't occur there. But then you get some more complex stuff where the species has been broken up into a bunch of different species, so it's no longer a single species. It's got a lot of information on here. And indeed, this is all right if you're doing it a couple times, or a couple species, but when you get out a thousand species, it's too hard to deal with, okay? There's gotta be a simpler way. Um, and so, yeah, it's just saying missing records. We've gotta track it down. Only once do we, when we get that data cleaned, can we do that projecting onto future climates, trying to do some validation, but the problem is we'll do this, we'll get that data all cleaned, get all that data together, cleaned up, do our research, file it away. We get those publications out, we file that data set away. The next person that comes along and wants to do similar sort of stuff, they have to go and do that same process again of cleaning up all that data. Okay, so we wanted to get around that. Um, so we started with Edgar. Edgar was funded through ANS. Um, part of the reason for it is we know there's vast amounts of information on climate change in the literature. We know the methods are there, we know the impacts are there, but it's largely still in that literature. We want to try and get some of that translated back out to the general public. Um, but there's also this largely untapped knowledge and experience that's in that general public, that people out there know a lot of stuff that can feed into our modeling, and then that data and effort should be reused. So the Edward Project is an interactive website that exposes current research on the impact of climate change with Australian birds. Australian birds is one of the most most robust data sets that we've got. It's got some, just Atlas of Living Australia has about 18 million records for Australia birds. Well, you think of birds as 18 million records of the 30 million that represents all vertebrates. Okay, so it's a robust data set. Um, we can engage the knowledgeable public in improving that data set, cleaning it up. There are so many birders out in Australia at the moment. They're, the twitchers are out there they'd happily go to the site, see where their species is, or where that species is that they need to get off their life list, tick that box, but at the same time, they'll look at that data and say, no, this species doesn't occur here, or they'll clean up that taxonomy for you, saying, hey, this has been broken out into this subspecies. We can use that, that enthusiasm birders have. Um, but then we also enable reuse through download options on the site, um, but also, store all of that information that we get back on observation records gets pushed up to Atlas of Living Australia, where it's that national database. And we have also store all the model results in the Tropical Data Hub at James Cook University. So this is Edgar. It's just, you go to the site, it's simple, 
interface. You get information about it up at the top. You go there, it's blatantly obvious. You know what to do. You type in your species and you go, okay? Um, with respect to the about, it states right there, the two key aims of this site is to allow people to explore future impacts of climate change and improve the accuracy of the models, okay? So for the future impacts of climate change, the site is simple. People go to it, they type in their favorite species. It's amazing how many people have their own favorite species. I would have thought, oh, you go for the iconic ones, you go to emu, cassowary, Goldie and finch. No, it's all different. It's, it's amazing how many people just go and find their different species and you get that phone call. Is this really gonna happen to my species? Because what you get, is you get information about, so here's just for the cassowary, you see where it's been observed, the larger the circle, the larger number of records in that area, okay? You see these brown dots are the historic observations, so where the species used to be but is no longer current, and you can see where the blue is, where its, where its core distribution is now. These are observations that are unclassified. Guaranteed, this is an old record that says it's in Queensland, okay? Um, you can look at the climate suitability, this yellow to green. It gives you a measure of how suitable that climate is for that species, okay? And so people can see this and get this. If you look at something like Gouldian Finch, you start to see there's vagrant records in here that are coming out where just somehow that species made it down there. It's been observed. It's a museum specimen. You know it was down there, but it's it's not part of their natural distribution, okay? So it's a vagrant, or it could be a released one. Now, we've gone through seeing historic, eruptive, vagrant, unclassified core and introduced. Those are the terminology we use because that's what the birders know. That's what the bird watchers understand, okay? We had to use that language for them. Um, and so you can turn on and off the climate suitability, the observations, you can download the data directly from here. There's one little button up here that says see future projections. When you do that, it comes up with an image like this. There's four different emission scenarios. These are what are coming out next year in the, by the IPCC, so the International Panel of Climate Change. Okay, it's, it's got the different emission scenarios. We make the default, the current one we're tracking, the highest emission scenario. So you can see where it'll be right now in 2015, but all the way through to 2085. Now, in the press, you get enough doom and gloom. So I chose a species here that's saying, hey, suitability is actually gonna increase with climate change. Far, there's few species that do this, but this is one of them. There's a little button here that you can press and it'll nicely show you that video that transitions through time, okay? So that's seeing the current information. If you wanna help improve the accuracy of the future, there's this little login button. You go to the login button, it brings you to Atlas of Living Australia. We've been working with them a fair bit because they're that long-term storage of these observation records and this feedback. And so you log in through Atlas of Living Australia, it brings you back to our site, and now you've got an ob a thing that's saying vet the species, okay? So that you can go in, click on this, and it provides you that little bit more information, a vetting interface. It gives you a little more information in our dots here saying that, hey, although those are historic there, there's a couple unclassified points in there under that area. Or you're now starting to see these doubtful ones. I wanted to put absolute rubbish because we know they're wrong, but that was too harsh for the birders. They didn't, they didn't like that terminology. So you start to see where things have been classified as absolutely wrong. Um, you can zoom into areas and by saying select observations, you just put a bounding box over observations, they become highlighted, and you can classify them as doubtful, historic, vagrant terminology for the birders again. And then provide comments. You hit save, that gets pushed off into the database. What happens immediately is that that information is stored and it's assumed that that person knows what they talk about but inf that information is sent up to a few panel, or a panel of experts, bird watchers, that we have that vet the vetting effectively. Um, but 
what the system does is it does nightly checks of Atlas of Living Australia to see if any new information has come in through them. It does a bit of filtering up front through some data vetting polygons and some analysis we do beforehand before it makes it to the site. But any new data, any vetting that someone's done will nightly trigger model reruns, okay? So what happens is the new observation records are sent off to our high performance computing unit runs all the necessary analysis in the background, so no one ever sees it. No one ever sees a couple hours, 15 cores working behind the scenes to get these models out, but it just comes up in that simple interface on the front end. Um, better close up there. Just want to put this slide from Anne saying thanks for the support. Um, I also have to thank my development team. Um, they've been absolutely great with it. There's the website. Please do go check it out. Last thing, Edgar, I thought I'd leave this blog post up while I answer questions, how we came up with the name. Um, it's kind of summarized right here. Our ANS project name was APO3. So the one developer said, well, APO3 in Leet speak is APOE, so APO. We're talking Australian birds. Think of ravens, Edgar Allan Poe and the raven. And that's how it came up with it. Thank you, Jeremy. Um, now open the floor to questions. If anyone has a question, they please um, come up to the microphone um, and uh, state your name and affiliation for asking a question. Speak, please. <coughs> Hi, Joanne Daly from CSIRO. I was actually interested in um, relating this talk to the one I went to just before yours, which was talking about uh, tracking annotations to, in that case, scholarly texts. And it struck me as I was listening to that how useful it would be in an environment like this, because I work in the area of biodiversity bioinformatics, that instead of just modifying the data or actually just having an authority version of the data that changes the raw data, it would be great to be able to track through and so that when anybody goes in, an expert goes in, they can actually not only see the latest version of the data which has been cleaned, but actually go back and see right back to the raw data itself to see what's been changed, just to make sure that we don't clean data incorrectly, because that's my worry. Yeah, one of the things I meant to say was you can actually look at those observations. You can get, you can select those occurrence records on the site. Um, so if I just go back, you can literally hover over, click on one of these sites, and it's going to give you that raw data, and it's going to give you that history of what comments have been made on it. So what pops up is a little information box about that site. So you get to see all that raw information that Atlas of Living Australia has, plus comments people have made previously on that observation records. So I'm Bernie Pope from VLSCI. Um, I was just interested to know, you, you seem to suggest that you've been liaising with bird watchers in the design of EDCA. I'd wonder if you could make a few comments about what you did exactly there. Um, I've worked a fair bit with BirdLife Australia, or formerly Birds Australia, um, and Charles Darwin, um, uh, sorry, a few people out of Charles Darwin University that are avid bird watchers. Um, BirdLife Australia, is one of the main contributors of bird observation data to Atlas of Living Australia. And they are, in essence, just bird watchers trying to bring that information together. Um, so I've been closely working with them on a number of projects looking at potential impacts of climate change on birds, both for the last 60 years, but also into the future. Um, there's several large initiatives that are doing that. And one of the things we're finding is bird watchers have a completely different mentality to researchers. Just like to my project team, it's a completely different mentality um, of the way of thinking about things, the way of interacting um, with the information, with the data. And so all the way along with this one, one of my um, project team, Lauren Hodgins, she's an RA of mine, she's also a bird watcher. And so she's been more of that analyst role, saying, making sure that what we put together fits with what bird life, what 
the researchers at Charles Darwin University need and require. Um, but it's been constant contact with them throughout the whole development. Thank you very much, Jeremy.